So it's 631 and I do want to start promptly. Um, so I'm going to call this meeting to order and the focus of this meeting is to do um, a policy training workshop um, using some of the scenarios that we have um, from the Carver Institute that um, gives us sort of a possible something possible scenario that might happen and then how we we would use our policies to interpret and adjust our actions due to the policy that we're present due to the um, scenario and the policies that we already have written um the i chose this one um, which i emailed to you a couple of days ago because it's something that has happened before and has happened recently as well is when board members want more information from the board about something that has happened in the most recent instance which is only a week or two ago um, i was approached by a community member who wanted uh, me to answer some questions for them which i then put to lane um, a few other board members did as well they were approached by various community members about athletic policies etc mine was about a, a the water the lead in the water at brookfield school um, so we, we approached lane and he emailed us that he thought that um, this was taking a lot of time and not necessarily, you know, board work. So um, this scenario just seems perfect for us to address. And like, how should we interpret our policies in this um, instance? Um, so we're going to go through this, this scenario using your policies, either you've got them um, in a paper copy or there's one available on our website. You go to OSSD board under governance, governance and function and then drop those down and you'll see um, our, our copy of our policies there. So why don't I just not assume people have already read through this. Um, so using, the, I'll give 10 minutes. So we'll get back at 643 and we'll discuss where do we find the evidence in our ends or executive limitations or board management um, delegation, et cetera. And then we'll talk about how we should best um, address this situation. All right. All right. So 10 minutes. Are we ready to start discussing this? Okay. All right. So um, everyone's read the, the scenario. Um, and I'll read it for Orca. A board member keeps asking the CEO for detailed reports re regarding operations. The information required does not pertain to any ends or executive limitations policies. The CEO has refused to supply the reports, saying that it would take too many staff hours to produce them. What should the board member do? All right, so what have we already said in our relevant policies? Um, obviously, this does not address our ends. It's nothing about our ends. So someone pipe up. What does it say in our executive limitations? Well, it, it, you know, <clears throat> if it didn't have that part that the info asked for had nothing to do with ends or executive limitations, then it, in 2.8.1, data required by the board shall be supplied by the superintendent. However, because that phrase is in there, 3.1 then comes into play, the unity of control. Instruction from individual board members. I'm not reading it, I scribbled notes. Mm -hmm. uh, from individuals is not binding, and if uh, the superintendent deems it too labor intensive, time, time intensive uh, for the staff. Did I jump? Am I not doing this right? No, that's okay. right. Okay. It says anyone else have anything else with executive limitations in, in the twos time? The you know, all the 2.0 policies to 2.8. Uh 3.3, 3.33 also talks about the board won't interfere with what has been delegated to the CEO or the superintendent. Okay. What else? Three point one point one is unity of control, right? That um, it is our, our, ourselves as a unified body. Anything else? 
Those are the two I, I had, 3.1, 3.3 under board. And then um, under governance, I had uh, 4.53A with the interaction to the, with the superintendent is limited. I also had 4.1.2, the sentence about the board's major policy is intended on ends and not administrative or programmatic means to attain in those. Anything else in the fours? Oh, I, I, I want to be sure I, I'm not going to name a number right now, but the, this scenario, but also thinking, Laura, about the scenarios that you specifically said in our world that just came up um, in terms of uh, board interaction with the community and how that happens, that, you know, they can come and we have a public session and we can't necessarily do anything about it, but that's how they can bring stuff to us. Um, and that we're not necessarily the go between from that. They can come to, they can go directly to the superintendent. They can come to a meeting. So I have no number, but those are things that mm -hmm. are coming up for me. And yeah. 4.13, um, we need to be disciplining ourselves about making sure that we're following our policies. That's why we're doing this. Exactly. So we pass um, Anything else in the governance process, you know, in the fours? No. Not that I saw. I did I jotted down, I think for me, where this becomes a little cloudier is our relationship to the public that we do, we are the representatives of the public. Um to the CEO or the superintendent. And I find there's a little bit of a rub there is that we are called by our constituents. And, you know, that's to me is sort of the point of conflict sometimes um, because we are called to represent um, the constituents that we serve and their interests in front of um, the superintendent. Yeah, I, I think, um, and I think it's a really good point um, I can tell you that it's kind of similar to uh, the superintendent's role. You know, if I get a, a complaint or a concern that comes in over a teacher, you know, my job is to refer it to the teacher or the principal first. Um, and so it's kind of, kind of the same thing. And the most difficult time to do that is usually your first six months in a new district because typically they have, it hasn't been done by the previous administration. Um, and so it's a tough six months because, you know, people are, are looking to you, they're judging you, you know, they want you to be responsive or interactive on their behalf. <clears throat> but um, what I usually find is that probably after about, about four to six months of, of sending people in the right direction, it, it, gets, it gets a lot easier. People get the message that that's the expectation, so they do tend to start to go there first. But it is not easy by any means. So I, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, the other piece that I would say about this one is that as a board, um, as a board, so not as a, necessarily as an individual, you always have the right if as a board you decide that there is more information that you want or you need out of me. I will usually provide it if I've got the time just because if people have the question, you know, I try to answer. Um, but as a board, you, you sit down in a board meeting and say, hey, no, um, you know, I'm, I'm making a motion that, you know, Lane needs to provide this report or these details. And then you guys vote on it. And the second you vote on it and there's a majority, um, it's a done deal. And the other time that that should happen in terms of the board, if, if there are questions about me being honest with what I'm portraying or with what the superintendent is portraying, um, in those cases, you always want to gather more information. Um, but again, that's a, that's a board function, a board, board role. Um, if an individual has a concern um, in the board meeting, you bring it up and say, hey, you know, I'd like to make a motion to, to um, examine this information because we're not sure if the right information is out there. Um, and you, that's a part of your oversight, which, which I would argue, you, you know, sh you should always do if there's questions. Um, so just, just my thoughts as we're bouncing around here. Well, along with that, I, in the conflict of interest, uh, complaints of conflict of interest, so 4.5 and way down there. Um, oh my gosh, where was I? just that interactions with the um, public recognize the same limitation and inability of any board member to speak for the board. Um, 
uh, of course I can't find what I was just looking at, but, but th that individuals can't make um, decisions or speak for the whole board um, in terms of our, our contact with the, with the public, which is hard in a small town, but. Yep. <laughs> I would also say, Lane, though, that you have to be careful about saying, well, if we want information, again, we need to make sure if it has to do with monitoring one of our policies, sure. But if it's just somebody in the public is, is demanding that we turn over information, it has nothing to do with ENDS or with the policies that we monitor unless we want to change a policy we follow our policies so no even i mean we can we can i guess vote as a board to decide to request that information but i will not be voting along with the rest of the group because we'll be breaking our own policies so well, and but also monitoring lane's performance that. pardon also monitoring lane's performance not just not just uh, uh, monitoring that we're following our own policies. We also have a responsibility to to m monitor and and review Lane's performance. So right, Lane's that case, performance. That performance is how is he doing in in meeting the outcomes that are that are out in our ends, and in how he is following the executive limitations policies. That's the only information that we are allowed to use to actually evaluate him. Now we can go out and get some information. We can monitor a policy on our own, but we can't, we, that's it, unless we want to change a policy. And that's why I keep on saying you can't just willy nilly decide, oh, well, we don't like what he, what he did over here because we're hearing a bunch of, fuss from community members if it's if it's legit then we need to go into our policies and say we've monitored this policy maybe we need to change that policy because he's he's somehow doing something that is causing a problem in the system but until we change that policy if we accept the monitoring reports which we have been accepting all of the executive limitation monitoring reports and the ends reports. That's how we evaluate. That's what we look at, unless we want to change a policy. And and I or unless we want to throw this governance structure out and and pick a different governance structure. And, but and right I, now and, we have to follow those policies. And I'm in agreement with with what Ann says in the fact that you know those exceptional circumstances where you're checking, you know, should be the exception, not the rule, right? Um, because if something exceptional comes up, you know, you need that flexibility as a board to be able to check on things. But if it's happening all the time, then you probably got bigger problems to worry about than, yeah, um, either with your superintendent or with with um, the interpretation of, of the governance itself. <clears throat> Yeah, I think if it's an ongoing issue, you know, you look back at, say, some of the policies that might fit um, to cover some of the questions, you know, if it's treatment of staff and students or it's, you know, that those communication and support to the board or whatever, um, the questions come sort of under the realm of those policies. Um, then you can revisit those policies and say, well, you know, maybe we need to broaden that that interpretation so that we can better understand or ask questions about um, Lane's performance and have him give those reports to us under that um, executive limitation. All right, let's, let's move on. So according to the board's policies, the next question, does the scenario refer to anything that's been delegated to the CEO, who is our superintendent? I said no on that one. Everyone in agreement with Brian? I mean, I said 
yes, in that, you know, he's expected to deal with us, um, report to us as a body and to provide the board with the information that we ask of him as a body. Um, so, you know, Brian, you're right in that if it's just one person, it's the answer would be no. And I would, I would also say he's, he's got to have an idea of, of how this, how we govern as a board also himself. So he, he's aware that, geez, I'm, I'm getting asked to provide this and this and this, and I'm trying to do my actual job of creating these outcomes for the system. And I can't do it because I keep on having to produce a report to justify what I'm doing over here that that doesn't allow him that flexibility to to go out there and and produce the results that we want him to produce for the entire system. Um, so the next question would be, does this scenario reflect behavior consistent with the board's governance process and board management delegation policies? What did you guys think about that? Yes, the CEO said, I'm not going to produce this report. It's going to be too cumbersome on me. I've got other things. And he refused to provide the information. What action, if any, should the board or board member now take? Um, actions that you believe would be consistent with the governance process and um, policies. I put it, if um, the, the board members want some action they need to have the chair put it on the agenda and discuss it and for a possible motion for action by the superintendent any other thoughts on that one i i would also say um you know you need to look at is this an issue that has been is has been delegated to the superintendent but in a way that's so open or so uh, flexible that we need to dive down one one step further and give him a little bit more guidance in terms of what is allowable or not allowable and 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 amend a policy if we if we needed to which would take place in the, in the discussion phase and then if right. however we would decide then we would go to a, a motion on what action, whether it would be a new policy or to designate the superintendent to produce the report. Any other thoughts on this? Um, my thought was, was a little more basic, but just educate the board member on proper procedures as well and refer them back to the policies. Mm -hmm. I actually think, I mean, this is a, a scenario that's bothered me for a number of years. I think um, Anne's right. This is our policy. And she probably remembers me about eight years ago challenging our former superintendent about this because I think where, where there's a, a gap here is that um, when the, the superintendent's you know, have always said that the that anyone in the community with certain concerns needs to go directly to them um, to voice concerns and complaints. And what happened um, back then is that the superintendent brought up this exact same scenario when we tried to advocate for um, positions of our constituents. The hole or the gap is that we as a board have no idea then if it's just one person or two persons complaints or issues or concerns, or if the superintendent has received 10 different um, concerns from people going directly to him or her. Um, 
that to me is where we are not able to monitor the situation because our constituents are going directly to the superintendent and the superintendent may not be communicating that to the board. Um, and we therefore have no way to know the concerns that um, people in Brookfield, Braintree and Randolph are sharing with our CEO. So um, it's happened before um, and you know, major things were not uncovered because of that. Um, for instance, some of the issues with our former facility director. And I think those are major issues. And as a board, I think we need to figure out how we can address that um, sort of hole in our interpretation of these policies. I don't know, Lane, what do you think? Am I totally off the deep end here? No, I and I think we talked probably a few, maybe a year or so ago about this because it it was a concern that that I actually brought up in one of the EL reports. Um, and I think kind of where the discussion was at that point in time was this idea that, um, you know, if it's come to me, and obviously I haven't addressed it to people's satisfaction, whether I should have or not, it's a whole other question. Um, they should be coming to you. When it comes to your level, if you're hearing it repeatedly, um, that it hasn't been resolved or that, um, you know, you're getting it from multiple people, I would argue that's a time when you as a board would say, hey, you know, there's something bigger going on here. You know, Lane or the superintendent has said it's been resolved, but we're still hearing these complaints and things don't match. That's when as a board that I would say you would stop and say, hey, let's pass a motion to look a little bit deeper into this. These are the things that we think we need to look at. Or if you think it's um, something that's rising to a, an even higher level, I mean, it could be criminal or whatnot. Um, I would even, um, you know, connect with, you know, like Pietro, have an independent investigation done. Um, so, you know, you have two pathways depending upon the level of seriousness of, of what you're hearing. Because if I, as a superintendent, have had a long time to address it, and I doesn't feel like I have addressed it, and I haven't been keeping you in the loop on how I did it, or if what I'm telling you doesn't match what people are telling you, that's something you should look at. Um, and perfectly within in your right, and I would expect you to. Um, by the way, you know, in some of the comments, you're right. Um, if a superintendent doesn't uh, present the information to you, you may not know. Um, and that's a problem if that's happening, right? You know, usually with the executive sessions and the superintendent's reports and the other conversations we have, I try to keep you in the loop as much as I can on stuff that might be critical or might hit hit uh, hit you in terms of somebody asking you um, questions or, or having concerns about things. And so hopefully I've been doing a good job about that. <clears throat> but yeah, that would be a concern. But I would argue if, if you're getting stuff that, uh, you know, just isn't isn't adding up, you check. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Any other further steps or questions um, about this scenario or how we would handle it as a board um, if, you know, something like this comes up? Um, I do have a question. So um, I do appreciate this overview. Um, it is helpful for me. I do get approached a lot um, as a school board member uh, with questions about different aspects of the school. And I was one of the people that had reached out to Lane um, about the athletics. I guess, you know, according to what I was told, um, by the people who came to me is that they had reached out to the, the athletic director, they had reached out to the principal, and they had reached out to Lane. Um, I did share with them that, you know, Lane has a lot on his plate. So if there was a delay in getting that information, that, you know, please be understanding, but that there's with COVID a lot going on. Um, you know, they weren't happy with what the, with, with, what the athletic director said or the principal. Um, so I guess I, in my, I just don't know, in my opinion, 
what I, or in your opinion, what I should have done differently. Do I, they were saying they weren't hearing from him again, being respectful of Lane's time. I understand Lane that I think you did get to them. It, it was probably a rapid email following the one that you, they had sent already. Um, and I was defending the school and their, their situation. Um, but should I not bring that forward? That's kind of the way that I feel right now is that I just shouldn't say anything because I hear, I understand clearly what Anne says about our, our governance. But I also feel like since the first time I joined this board, we talked about wanting to be, have better communication with our communities. We wanted to be approachable. Mm -hmm. We wanted this to be the community um, you know, our community school. So I sometimes feel like there's a real rub with that. We're, we're told this is what we want, but well, you really can't do it this way. So I know I often feel like a lot of this frustration is because of me and, and what I'm doing. Um, but in my other world, my job is to communicate, 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 and which is what I do all the time. So this is just very different for me. Um, when I don't feel like that people come to me, they've elected me in a position and I ha just have to sit back and say, you know, please come to the school board, share your concerns, but we're not going to take any action on it then. But that's so, the, oops, sorry, go ahead. And, and I'm not, and I'm certainly not saying that anybody is right or wrong here. I'm just sharing how I feel about it. The, the conflict piece is this, is that I responded pretty quickly to the people um, that asked me questions. And I think that's one of the reasons why that conflict um, protocol is so important. Um, because it's really easy for somebody to go to a board member and say, I talked to Lane when they may, may have not. Um, and it's a lot easier to have it come back to me and then you check in with me. Hey, did so-and-so actually check in with you and have a conversation? You know, then it's it's so I can say, yeah, I did. You know, they I, I tried to explain it. They weren't happy. Um, they still seem to have concerns. So, you know, it's appropriate, you know, for the board to take over at this time. But that's part of the, the problem. And one of the concerns that I have is um, not only did I respond to everyone, but most of the responses were quite lengthy, required me to go in. You know, well, I don't believe you, Mr. Millington. I need you to go and get the guidance and show me the guidance. Um, and so it took time to go and get the guidance and cut and paste and explain what the guidance meant and then have people argue with me that I was interpreting it wrong. And then me right off to the agency of education and have them do an interpretation, which took a week to get their interpretation out of it to find out that my interpretation was correct. Um, so that's, that's part of the, I think part of the conflict piece is, um, it just, is making sure that folks have the right information. You know, I did a long lengthy report on um, students that were allowed to go to other schools based on an assessment from a person who to this day is unknowns to me um, with accusations that I was allowing uh, teachers to move their kids around willy nilly wherever they wanted to go as a benefit to teachers, which was the farthest for the truth and to that day, I don't know if that misconception has been addressed because the person was not asked to talk to me. So there are, again, some of that can relay misconceptions about me or what I've done or, or my record. And that's concerning to me because I too live in the community. Um, as an administrator, it's important to be seen as transparent and open and honest. And it's, it's, it's hard to do that when you can't connect with people, um, try to connect mis misconceptions or have a legitimate conversation with them about what their concerns were because um, okay, it's just, uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, it's difficult. So I think, uh, go ahead, Ann. I was just gonna say, the other thing is we still have, I mean, as a board member, this is a, is, this is a little bit different way of running a board than a lot of other boards are run and when people oftentimes think of school boards they think oh well if i talk to the board member then they can get in there and they can you know influence the operational decisions that are being made and and 
and be involved in that. And that really isn't what our school board has been or has done for the last, for a long time now, since we've switched our governance structure. So we're looking more at what, what outcomes do we want to have? And if folks are, you know, community people are really concerned, then how is the sports, whether or not the sports policy for COVID, how is that impacting outcomes? And that's where, again, our, our communication to our community is not, it's not let's be out there and, and open up the floodgates to have everybody tell us what they don't like or what they want for the system in, in terms of operations because every you're never going to be able to please everybody but we've got um, well unless you disagree with it but we have a set of policies that are that are aiming us hopefully toward creating a system that that produces well educated well prepared young people to move on to the next stage of their life that's what our focus is about it's not about second guessing whether or not you know lane should be doing such and such in order to produce those outcomes that's all his his area and the professional educators area and that doesn't mean that parents because generally it's parents who have operational issues um they you know there is a way for them to express their feeling we don't have a parent uh parent teacher organization right in i don't think in any of our schools so again if you've got a group of parents who want to work with the principals and influence in that direction that's a great way for them to feel more integrated in the schools but as a board we haven't unless we want to again unless you want to change the way the board is operating we're looking more systemically k-12 and where are we going what do we what do we need these these young people to be able to do when they finish our system and move to the next stage um, so it's a more, it's, it's not, a, it's not, we're not looking at the micro, we're looking at the macro when, when we're um, looking at the system as a whole. Yes, I think that's true. I think that some of the scenario that Lane just talked about, though, you know, parents exhausting, you know, their, the, their avenues, um, through the AD and the principal and then coming to him and he's still doing work, right? It's, you know, circumventing us, but he's still doing a lot of work that, you know, answering those questions that doesn't involve us at all, right? You know, so I don't think, I don't, I don't think that's saving him any work really, because instead of having people come through the board, basically he's asking, answering lots of individuals questions who are coming directly to him. And as the manager, he can then work with his administrators and say, hey, we need to communicate better with our 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 community because people are are concerned or, hey, A.D., when we 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 really need to make sure that parents understand that when there's a case in the school, that's going to influence the, the the sports and that's going to be a major rub with the community and we need to be out front on this and make sure that our that our that our customers know that and 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 be a, be ahead of that but that's his management of his administrators and and his you know instructing his his people to get the word out to to his to the community and to parents well i do appreciate the conversation because it is really helpful for me and i think that when i'm caught in the moment i trying to do the impossible which is to please everybody um so i i appreciate the conversation thank you for the clarification are there any I'll other comments 
from anyone? Well, I just wanted to kind of chime in a little bit. Um, and I understand what everyone's saying, but I can tell you from, you know, from the other side, when you come to the board and they give you the line of, you know, I can't answer that. It's policy governance. You need to go down. That is so frustrating as whether you're a parent or a, um, you know, taxpayer or something. And that's the answer you get. It, it really seems like the board is just blowing you off and you can't do it. And then as a board member, it feels the set you're, that you're actually doing the same thing is these people have elected you and you just have to pass the buck down the lane and your, our hands are tied and it. I don't like that feeling one way from either side, but you know, I mean, that's our policy. That's our policy, but I don't like it. So. Well, and I, I have to chime in and say, I, I think, I would like to have a conversation about the structure and the possibilities of changing it because I don't think that the community necessarily, they don't get these trainings, right? So they don't necessarily know what they're electing us to and what they're electing us to could be something that we can't do under this current structure. And, and frankly, perhaps not what someone would run for school board to serve in something that's in that structure. So I, I'd like to not make a motion, but I, I'd like to um, suggest and, and I hope that we can um, look at our structure and just like we should look at our policies and think, is this serving our community um, the best that it can? And this is, and I don't say that in order to please everyone, but I do say that, again, to serve the community as best we can and perhaps a policy governance structure is not how we can best serve our community and our district. I will caution you. A um, couple of things. Uh, first off is that people will respond based upon the expectations that they have. And if board members are always inviting folks in to have those sorts of conversations that through your own policies are supposed to be pushed down to the superintendent, if you don't have that uncomfortable moment with them and push them where they should go, you will always get people coming to you with that expectation, right? You set the expectations for folks. Number two, if you plan on moving away from policy governance, um, you need to check state law because state law in terms of the board's relationship with its superintendent is pretty close to policy governance. So just a couple of cautions there. And I in no way mean to imply I definitely think we should do that or that I understand everything that it would take to do that or what other options are. I just, um, this brings up for me, again, is it, it and, and I don't think that an alternative structure would be bring it on people. It's always open forum. It's always come and tell me all the things that, pardon my language, piss you off about how the, the school is being operated. I don't, I don't think that's the, um, I'm having, I'm being distracted here. So I'll stop there. Four year old. Anything uh, else? I was just going to say, <clears throat> I'll, I'll jump on the bandwagon here. Um, and I think it was just really interesting on a side note, watching that conversation just unwind and every single person on here was doing a lot of this. So I feel like there's a lot of consensus into um, into keeping this discussion open, um, and I think that you know, again, as a newbie, you know, it's it is that question of of as Hannah said, as Brian said, like how do we as a board serve the community in a way where the community feels that it's being served by the board members they elected? So that's kind of where you know. Um, I feel that situation lies too. So that's it. Yeah, it's a really inf interesting conversation and, you know, possibly something to be pursued at a retreat or something like that, either with a policy governance model um, and just asking, you know, a specialist about that. These are our, our hiccups with PG and, you know, where do we go from here to make our constituents feel better heard? You know, just an idea. Can I ask a, a, a random question? Do we know, or maybe Lane, you have the answer to this, how many school boards are run under this type of policy governance? What's the kind of percentage? Uh, it's fairly high in Vermont. Um, 
I've actually been called into one or two that are thinking of converting to it to talk with them about how it works. Um, I can guarantee you uh, that if you do not have at least a similar model um, where the superintendent um, has clear separation from the board, you won't keep the superintendent. They, they won't, you won't get a good one that'll come and want to work with you. Um, so that's, you know, that's the other caution that I want to put out there. Um, cause it's a very, it's a very difficult role, um, to do when you're not your own master. If the board is taking over everything, then what do you need a superintendent for? Um, so just, just a couple other things to think about. And I'll say my, my wife works in the, the Barry school district and they're not policy governance and it puts a lot more work on the board members than, than what we have. They're, and they, they just have, lost their superintendent. Well, they, they, they got a new, new one. It wasn't because of their policy though. He I, left, I he know was, the old superintendent he wanted, it was. <laughs> he, he wanted to go to Colorado. Again, I interact with those guys. A lot of it was the lack of a clear definition between board and superintendent. <clears throat> I wonder if the opportunity we have, though, maybe in educating our public on our role with policy governance might actually go hand in hand as we share the new strategic plan. Is that an opportunity for us to actually um, educate and re-educate through a different um, medias, you know, is it, you know, up, up, there could be a written one, there could be something on the website, blah, 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 all that stuff. But that actually explains this is the role of your board. And this is how we, uh, you know, work collaboratively with the superintendent who he is doing all of this. And this is the strategic plan. So maybe as we work on that process, this is our chance to re-educate our communities really on what our roles are and what we can do in this elected position. Thanks everyone for an interesting conversation. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's worthwhile going through these and just reminding ourselves of, of sort of the ways upon which we are governed and under which uh, model sort of that we we're supposed to adhere to. So I think that was great. Any, any further thoughts before we adjourn? Well, I'm just curious how many of the board members have, I know Ashley and Brian, you were, you were at that training with Miriam Carver herself, right? When you first got on the board? Was that or the one that we did in the fishbowl? No, uh, I haven't been in any policy governance training then. Okay. No. And yeah, have can, anybody any hear me? can anybody hear me? Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Um, and so Miriam Carver hasn't come to do a training with us since I've been on the board. So it's been more than three years. Yeah, I think the only um, two folks that were there were Ann and, and Laura at the time that are currently on the board. Right. So no one has had any training in how how our board governs. So I went to a training put on by the, by the BSBA in Montpelier. It was an evening shortly after I was initially elected that was policy governance based and so I feel like I've had some training in addition to the little scenarios that we've done. I had done a an online one shortly after I was elected. It was put on by VSBA and it was an on uh, you know a remote one just online. It wasn't anything in person. And we've done a couple of facilitated retreats with Val Gardner who um, of course is a policy governance um, expert. I don't know how many of the current board members were there. I, I think Rachel was. Um, I don't remember if anyone else was. Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely something that we need to, you know, schedule in. Um, our last facilitated retreat was Susan Wholesome before the strategic planning one was on governance, although she's not a policy governance expert, I would definitely hire someone um, more like Val to do the next um, training if that's you know the, the, the way we want to go.
All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will adjourn the meeting at 726. Um, don't forget that there's a budget informational meeting on Wednesday this uh, next week, the 24th, and a um, the town meeting uh, before town meeting. So, so Monday, March 1st, it's called the annual school meeting. That's also at RUHS. All right. Have a good evening. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you.